I'm Matt McClure, and this is Currents. <music> President Obama reveals his budget plan, but does it benefit the common good? We'll find out. Plus, paying the ultimate price. A Pakistani man accused of blasphemy is put to death. And seeking help from the top. An opponent of Pakistan's blasphemy laws was gunned down. Now his brother wants the Pope to step in. He is not only martyred on for the Christianity, he is martyred on for the humanity. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. One budget battle is close to its conclusion in Washington, D.C., but another one is just heating up. Today, the House passed the compromise 2011 budget plan lawmakers and the president agreed on last week. That plan cuts spending by $38 billion over the remainder of this fiscal year. It still needs to be passed by the Senate and signed into law by the president. And speaking of Mr. Obama, he revealed his proposal for reducing the national debt yesterday in the nation's capital. CNN Sandra Endo is in Washington with details on that plan, and it's not sitting well with Republicans. President Barack Obama is pushing a new financial plan that he says will reduce the national deficit by $4 trillion in 12 years or less. We have to do it in a way that protects the recovery, protects the investments we need to grow, creates jobs, and helps us win the future. The president is calling for spending cuts to help the government pay down debt and live within its means. It's an approach that puts every kind of spending on the table, but one that protects the middle class, our promise to seniors, and our investments in the future. The most controversial call is for the repeal of the Bush-era tax cuts to the wealthiest Americans, something Republicans are vehemently against. They have their own 2012 fiscal plan, which they argue is a better starting point for securing America's financial future. Uh, and we do so by ensuring uh, that we bring down spending, that we reform the entitlement program so we get rid of the unfunded obligations over time. Uh, to retire the debt. Republicans are calling for $6 trillion in spending cuts over the next decade. This latest clash between the GOP and the White House comes on the heels of the debate over raising the nation's debt ceiling, another budget initiative the president will be hard-pressed to pass unless there is room to compromise with Republicans. That once again is Sandra Endo reporting in Washington. Now the president has asked congressional leaders to form a bipartisan committee. The group will meet early next month with Vice President Joe Biden to start negotiating a legislative plan to get the U.S. out of the red. So where does the president's spending plan fit with Catholic teaching? To find out, I spoke earlier today with Stephen Schneck from the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies at the Catholic University of America. Steve, thanks so much for being here once again. We appreciate your time very much. Thank you, Matt. Glad to, glad to be here. Well, of course, the big announcement coming yesterday out of Washington, President Obama's budget proposal uh, for the next fiscal year. Um, where do you see this falling in with Catholic teaching? Uh, it's a, a very interesting question. Um, first of all, it's, it's uh, you know, what I liked about this, uh, this, this budget is it's clearly uh, aimed at um, the moral dimensions of budgeting, just as actually uh, Representative Ryan claimed that his, his uh, budget, too, had a moral dimension. So, uh, you know, the president really aimed in that direction. But um, you ask specifically about Catholic, and there's this great line, and if you don't mind if I could, could read it here. Sure, absolutely. It, it goes as follows. But there has always been another thread running throughout our history, a belief that we are all connected, that there are some things we can, no, we can only do together as a nation. And it goes on in that vein and emphasizes um, a way of thinking about being Americans that's a little bit different than what we've been hearing lately. It's a way of thinking about Americans as part of a community, that is, as a, as a solidarity, as we say in Catholic social thought. And I found that very, very refreshing. So while there's much else about this budget that I find um, very, very much in sympathy with Catholic social thought, it's, its preference uh, for the concerns of the poor, for example, and its attention to those parts of society that are in the greatest need, uh, you know, while in a sense trying to share sacrifice among all parts, what really struck me was the very Catholic understanding that we human beings aren't isolated individuals, but we're all tied together by some kind of a thread, you know, that, well, 
you know, Sister Leo back in the fourth grade used to talk about as the mystical body of Christ. And I really like that language. There you go. Well, it's, it's a little bit less of every man for himself and a little more all for one and one for all kind of kind of mentality in this in this budget and i think that's really kind of clear when it when you look at the president's uh, proposal uh... when it comes to health care Me medicare in particular um, and also medicaid uh... the republican plan presented by paul ryan had put in uh... you know some some proposals in making medicare a voucher program and things like right. that but president obama said that's not going to happen especially not while giving tax breaks to some of the wealthiest americans does that kind of fall in line with with kind of what you were just talking about yeah and in, in fact that when the president addressed that that part of the budget you know he talked uh, about a sacred contract that America has with its citizens and particularly uh, with the elderly and um, you know pointed out that Medicare was part of that sacred contract uh, I mean that's a you know a way of talking about you know budgeting that's uh, I think in some contrast with the way that representative Ryan talked about it sure well, um, and let me ask you too about this uh, the, sort of the, the concept overall of the of debt, because all, it seems like all we're hearing out of Washington these days is we have to we have to tackle the debt, which is a, a noble goal. I think everyone is kind of in agreement on that. But Absolutely. in this time of recession, some economists say, well, you want to run deficits during a recession, so you're you're putting money back into the economy, you're trying to stimulate it, and then when you enter a time. Uh, where you're flourishing, then you start tackling the debt. So now might be the wrong time to tackle the, the debt. Is is any time a, a bad time to tackle the debt? You think um, as we as we look at it from maybe more of a, a moral standpoint? Well, um, you know, of course, you know the way that the economy works. There are times that are better for tackling an issue like debt, and times when not. It's the same thing true in family budgeting. Um, you know, there are times, frankly, when my family has to go into a little bit of debt, you know, to get through a month or to get through a year. Um, you know, but the hope is that uh, in, in better times, then we, we pay that down. Um, yeah, and it seems to me that there's a moral dimension to that. I mean, once we've, once we've taken on debt, we've taken on a bit of a moral obligation to pay it back. And in President Obama's discussion of this, he pointed out that, uh, you know, through the mid Mid, through the 90s, a number of resolutions had come to, uh, uh, you know, a budgetary situation where we were able to essentially balance the, the national um, uh, budget and therefore not driving up the debt. But that as a result, after 9-11, after um, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and, uh, and the Bush tax cuts, frankly, um, sort of broke that bargain. And the debt we ran up, an important debt to run up, I would say. I mean, this, these were important things to spend money for. But the debt that we ran up needs to be paid back. And now that it looks like we're starting to come out of the recession, this is a good time to be thinking about how we're going to be paying that back. So I think this is an appropriate time, morally, to start taking up those questions again. Sure. And one quick question here, uh, Steve, before I let you go. Any, sure. Anywhere um, th in this proposal from the president that you were disappointed? Yes. Uh, perhaps just a little bit. I, 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 I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed that Social Security is um, being at least considered for some tinkering in this proposal. It seems to me that it's quite clear, um, you know, that Social Security is not in any way contributing to our current, um, you know, deficit situation, and therefore I think that it's premature for us to begin, um, you know, moving in that direction. But other than that, I thought this was a very fine budget. All right. Well, Stephen Schneck from the Institute for Policy Research and Catholic Studies at the Catholic University of America, we thank you so much for joining us here once again on Currents. We appreciate it. Always great, Matt. Take care now. Thank you. Well, there is much more Currents coming up. U.S. bishops are weighing in on government funding for Planned Parenthood. That story and the rest of the day's headlines next. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Coming up later, an appeal to the Pope from Pakistan. We'll have the details. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Well, the Vatican's representative to Japan visited some of the area's hardest hit by the magnitude 9.0 earthquake and resulting tsunami that hit over a month ago. Archbishop Alberto Botari de Castello celebrated mass outside a cathedral in Sende City this past Sunday. It took place outdoors because the cathedral was judged unsafe after a magnitude 7.1 aftershock last week. 
The Archbishop also visited two other churches and met with bishops, priests, and Catholics who are caring for victims and assisting in the reconstruction effort in affected areas. Well, the Vatican is confirming the ordination of a new bishop in China. Catholic News Agency reporting it is the first such ordination since talks between the Holy See and China broke down last year. Now, those talks broke down after China's state-approved Patriotic Catholic Association named a bishop without the approval of the Vatican. The new bishop received the approval of both the Holy See and the Chinese government. U.S. bishops are urging Congress to vote for a resolution to defund Planned Parenthood. In a letter to Congress, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo wrote that although the budget debate involves sacrifice and hard choices, whether to fund one of the largest abortion networks in the country is not one of those hard choices. Cardinal DiNardo cited data showing Planned Parenthood performs about a third of the abortions in the U.S. Now, according to Planned Parenthood's 2009 annual report, Abortions account for just 3% of the organization's health services. Well, uh, U.S. bishops also commemorating the legacy of Pope John Paul II ahead of his upcoming beatification. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops has uh, launched a web page ahead of the late pontiff's beatification on May the 1st. The page features a 17-minute video highlighting John Paul's seven visits to the U.S. As Pope, he visited New York twice, once in 1979 and then later in 1995. And in what may be a first in the U.S., the Diocese of Providence, Rhode Island, has approved naming a new parish in honor of John Paul. Pope John Paul II Parish in Pawtucket will be a merger of two other parishes. The new name needs the approval of the Vatican, as only the Diocese of Rome, the 41 Diocese of Poland, and the diocese that received permission to celebrate John Paul's feast day can name parishes in his honor without Vatican approval. Well, meantime, it is the end of an era in the Diocese of Wilmington, Delaware. The diocese there will shut down its newspaper, The Dialogue, as part of cuts to help pay out more than $77 million to sex abuse victims. The paper has been published for 46 years. Now, the Diocese of Wilmington is also cutting other programs, including Catholic Charities Adoption Services. The cuts will result in the elimination of 22 jobs. And in a letter to parishioners, Wilmington Bishop William Maluli expressed his sincerest regret to those whose positions will be eliminated. Well, closer to home here, Rutgers University has clarified their announcement about a speech at the school by a woman who claims to be a Catholic bishop. Uh, the school's press release now states that the woman only claims to be a Roman Catholic bishop. The previous release had stated that she was the only, uh, was one of only three female Catholic bishops in the world. as She was excommunicated back in 2008, and this clarification was pretty much necessary because the church does not recognize the ordination of women. Such ordinations have no sacramental value. They are a serious violation of church law. Well, from the Vatican, the Holy See has announced it will set up a working group to review all translations of the new youth catechism, known as UCAT. Well, that comes following yesterday's news that the Italian translation of the book was being temporarily suspended after officials discovered it appeared to endorse the use of contraception to limit family size. That is something the church is against. The cardinal who oversaw the creation of UCAT said publication of the French translation has also been halted because of an issue in that version regarding the church's view of other religions. And back in Brooklyn, the Catholic Telemedia Network, which provides educational programming to Catholic schools in the diocese, announced the winner of a unique contest. CTN is really pleased to be able to come to this principal's meeting to award our media room to a very deserving school in the diocese. We just finished our contest. It ran from November until March, and today we announced the winner. We are so pleased that Holy Family School was the winner. They really went all out and used all of our services in a, in a very meaningful way. I am thrilled to death because my teachers worked very, very hard at doing this and cheering each other on and encouraging each other to use it and they continue to use it even though the contest is over. The media room is going to be a classroom that encompasses all of the latest technology for a teacher. It's going to be very helpful because the computer room is 10 years old so it's going to update a lot of our technology so that we can be in the 21st century. Technology in the words of Tom Friedman has made the world flat. This is the world that 
the students that are in our building are growing up in. Um, they are, for want of a better term, they are the digital natives. And what's unique uh, coming up for the next school year is we will be a totally broadband-based system, which means teachers just need to have an internet connection and uh, a large viewing device, and they can take advantage of our services. So we're really pleased about the advances that we're making at CTN. The technology just keeps on changing. Stay tuned, there's much more currents ahead. When we return, a farmer in Pakistan pays with his life after being accused of blasphemy. Welcome back. Well, Pakistan's blasphemy law has caught the attention of the world as a steady diet of high-profile arrests and widely publicized assassinations become almost constant in the news. Under the country's blasphemy law, anyone who speaks critically of Islam or the Prophet Muhammad commits a crime that's punishable by death. Opponents of the law say that it's vague language and the ability of accusers to get suspects convicted, sometimes based on nothing more than hearsay, offers no legal protection for the country's religious minorities. Lives often hang in the balance, which is what happened to one farmer who was accused of blasphemy, acquitted by the courts, but then ultimately lost his life to a blasphemy law vigilante. CNN's Nick Patton Walsh has more on the story. Out here, no one really honors the grave of Imran apart from his brother. A few weeks ago, Imran, a farmer, was shot dead by fundamentalist gunmen. He'd been accused of blasphemy, insulting the prophet. Few people know exactly what he's meant to have said, but that didn't save him. When I saw him lying there, he says, I felt the blood leave my body and that I was now alone. His brother shows me under Pakistan's controversial laws the indictment. Blasphemy cases can end with the death penalty, but sometimes begin with just hearsay. Well, this is the original complaint against Imran, his brother, and it says that Imran was overheard in a cafe saying something derogatory against the Muslim prophet Muhammad. Now, the complainant doesn't want to specify exactly what those words were. He says, out of respect for the Muslim faith. Imran was in custody for two years before a judge acquitted him, but he returned home to death threats that forced his family to move away from the farmland that fed them. Eventually, gunmen cornered Imran in the shoe shop. In his last panicked moments, we're told, he grabbed the man next to him for dear life. We found his widow and daughter living off a friend's charity, paralyzed by grief and poverty. Four-year-old Kazma says she knows daddy's dead, but that one day he will come back. His widow, however, told us that even now she supports the blasphemy laws as they protect their faith. Speaking out against the laws can be fatal. Two high-profile politicians were this year gunned down for suggesting they be changed. Radical clerics justified these murders and we learn a stoking tension in this nearby town. We've just driven into the town to talk to people at the mosque where allegedly some of the provocators trying to organise this murder were based. And as soon as we got out of the car, uh, we were mobbed by a pretty angry crowd. I think at this point it's probably the safest to leave. In this dusty town, a brutal and flawed type of justice, a sign of what a mix of poverty, religion and hate are becoming in Pakistan. Just a heartbreaking story all the way around. Well, stay tuned. There's much more currents ahead. Coming up, a staunch opponent of Pakistan's strict blasphemy laws was gunned down in cold blood last month. Now his brother makes a plea to the Pope. He was uh, fighting for the basic human rights and he had been helping many non-Christian people also when they were in difficulty. Finally tonight, Paul Bhatti was reluctantly thrust into the spotlight after the March 2nd assassination of his brother Shabazz Bhatti, Pakistan's first Christian cabinet member. Shabazz Bhatti was gunned down in his car in broad daylight under a hail of bullets because of his strong condemnation of the country's blasphemy law. Well, now Paul Bhatti has dedicated his life to making sure that his brother's life and death were not in vain. 
Paul's journey for religious freedom and an end to the blasphemy law in Pakistan led him to the doorstep of the Vatican, where he met with Pope Benedict to ask him to continue supporting the Christians of Pakistan. Rome Reports has the details. Paul Bhatti is the brother of Shabazz Bhatti, who was the first Christian to serve as a minister for the government of Pakistan. Shabazz was gunned down by Islamic extremists on March 2nd for his stance against the country's blasphemy law and his support of Asia Bibi, the woman who has been sentenced to death for violating this law. His brother Paul says that his family has forgiven his brother's killers because forgiveness is what the Christian faith teaches, and he hopes that the life of Shabazz will be remembered for his work in promoting peace. He is not only a martyrdom for the Christianity, he is martyrdom for the humanity because he was uh, fighting for the basic human rights and he has been helping many non-Christian people also when they were in difficulty. So his message or his efforts was that for the persons who need peace. Paul Bhatti recently traveled to Rome to meet with different religious leaders and to remember the death of his brother. They discussed the best way to arrive at a peaceful solution over the blasphemy law and the best way to move forward in a country where tension over religion has often resulted in violence in the past. Yes, I do admit that unfortunately there are some people who are not Muslim, they do not represent Islam, and they are creating problems for the people and citizens of Pakistan and distorting the image of Pakistan in the world. I mean, changes don't come suddenly. An uh, uh, event like this does influence the course of events and uh, such a tragic incident that has struck the whole country. We, we've got to build on that. We've got to take it forward, really. I don't see the change coming by itself, and I don't see it coming so soon. Paul Bhatti and the Grand Imam from Lahore, Pakistan, met with Benedict XVI at the Vatican. Bhatti asked the Pope to continue supporting the Christians of Pakistan, saying that the biggest problem they face is a lack of religious freedom due to the blasphemy law. Bhatti was recently named as the chairman to Pakistan's All Minority Alliance and hopes to carry on his brother's work of fighting for the freedom of religion. His message or his efforts was that for the persons who need peace, who need their own right, who need their freedom, who need uh, freedom of expression in the society. So <clears throat> as the Christian community was more victimized of that, so he worked more for that reason. The assassination of Shabazz Bhatti has left a tragic mark on the people of Pakistan. It's a mark that the Bhatti family hopes will remind others of the message of peace between all people to which Shabazz committed his life. Well, in a related note, an Italian Jesuit journal is reporting that the Bible owned by Shabazz Bhatti is being kept in Rome at the Basilica of St. Bartholomew as part of a collection honoring martyrs of the past century. And of course, our prayers uh, and thoughts continue to go with his uh, brother and his entire family. Well, that is it for this edition of Currents, but coming up tomorrow, we continue our look at Christian persecution around the world and learn how victims of persecution learn to forgive those who have trespassed against them. Until then, though, be sure to visit us online. We're at CurrentsNY.net on the World Wide Web. We're also on Twitter and on Facebook. For all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great night.